Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so we've been speaking about a new libclang based tool that I wrote. Um, that tool was basically born out of the um, excitement that I had about C++17 and the new features that um, it brought to us, but also about the um, disappointment that I had whenever I realized, well, I can't actually use all of these cool features today because I still need to wait for my compiler to support it, and that can usually take a while, especially if you're using, for instance, Linux, where, you know, it's not about the compiler release, but it's about when the compiler release actually makes it into your um, distribution repositories. So I basically went ahead and wrote a tool that just auto-translates C++17 to C++11. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, who am I actually? I'm a freelance software developer working on embedded systems in Berlin, in Germany. And what I like um, to focus on is the symbiosis between type safety and low-level software on the other hand. So if you think about software that works very close to the hardware, like controlling hardware registers directly, or just describing hardware layouts precisely. Um, usually, languages give, don't give you, you know, a lot of um, a lot of means to handle that kind of stuff. But C++ allows you not only to directly interface hardware, but also to um, write powerful abstractions that actually make sure that what you write really makes sense and is correct in a sense. Plus, it allows you to automate lots of stuff. People who have been in my talk yesterday will know what I'm talking about here. Uh, I've got some side projects, uh, mostly in game console emulation, where um, if you've ever tried to emulate, for instance, the GameCube or the Nintendo Wii on your computer, you will know the program Dolphin, which I've been uh, working quite a lot on the GPU emulator core for. Um, and obviously, we've also been using C++ for these projects and also quite cutting edge C++. So there was al always the struggle, kind of, how modern can we go um, while actually still supporting the majority of our users. Uh, I tweet about my stuff on Twitter. Um, I publish most of my source code on uh, GitHub and I've got a website, so if you want to learn more, feel free to check those out. Right. And to quickly get to know my audience, how many of you are actually using C++ let's say 14 at their job or privately. So that's about 50% of the room. Um, for the rest, um, do you have a vague idea of what C++17 is about? Like, have you heard about, like who's heard about C++17 features so far? That's about 75% maybe? All right, cool. So we'll show a couple of example code snippets later, so don't be afraid if you uh, don't know any cool features off the top of your head. So the first question I want to remind everybody of, so to speak, why do we even care about C++14 and 17? Um, and this is mostly about 17, actually, um, but I identified four kind of major pieces of uh, extensions. The first one is functionality. Uh, we've got the newest file system library in 17, and we've got things like um, std string view, for instance, which um, just allows us to access new well, actually, the parallel STL algorithms is what I also wanted to mention. So that's stuff you just couldn't do before using only the standard library. And with C++17, you now can do. There are other features that uh, allow us to express programmer intent more precisely than before, uh, specifically thinking about vocabulary types like std optional and std variant, but also about std string view, for instance. So um, rather than take, having a function take a char pointer and a length, for instance, you know, just pass in a string view. And that is in particular convenient when you have multiple of these kind of pairs. Um, it kind of prevents programmer errors in that people might mistake one length for the other and then just mix up these variables. Right, the third thing is more ergonomic metaprogramming. Um, features such as fold expressions and const expressive enable us to do that. And this is actually quite the dramatic like, when you read about it, it sounds kind of small, but the improvement is actually quite dramatic. Like, it easily manages to compress things that took hundreds of lines of code down to something that um, easily fits on your actual screen, for instance. Um, we'll see an example of that later as well. Right, and the fourth point that I identified is convenient syntax sugar, just things that were kind of awkward to do before, uh, more easily with C done with C++17. Thinking of structured bindings, for instance, um, I had another one of mine that I forgot, unfortunately. But, oh, actually, the if init um, syntax, where you can now 
have a separate variable initialization, separate from the condition in, directly in your if parentheses, so to speak. So that's things that just make things easier to read and hence are nice to have, even though not critical. And I personally see a lot of potential in these improvements. Potential, for instance, in terms of readability, because I've sometimes come to some of my uh, colleagues and friends and they've been trying to solve some problem but weren't really used to solving it the modern way. Um, they basically had a solution at hand and it was kind of awkward, awkward sometimes. And I went ahead and told them, hey, you can use this C++17 feature, you can use this C++14 feature, and it makes stuff much prettier. And the thing saying that I often got was that it almost looks like I've been writing Python now, which is quite ironic, but um, the difference here is we get the simplicity of Python, but we also get the type safety of C++, because we still have fixed types that just harmonically work together. Uh, second point is we get a much lower entry bar barrier for metaprogramming techniques, where metaprogramming, and especially template metaprogramming, is, has historically been a thing that you probably wouldn't do in your job because you're probably the only person on your team who actually understands any of what's going on. C17 really makes it much more easy, much more accessible to the point that you don't need to be the expert programmer on your team anymore to apply the techniques. And you can with good conscience, actually hand off the code to your coworkers or even to graduate engineers who will, will be able to make sense out of it. Because it's not like thousands of spinny and um, function overloading tricks anymore, but it's just simple code that looks reasonably simple and can be worked with. And the third point is more type safety in general, largely due to the vocabulary types, for instance, that just allow us to express things that um, have two different states, for instance, and one specific type that is standardized across the language now. So with that, um, oh yeah, also, if you want to learn more, check out the C++17 Tony tables. Oh, there's a link in the presentation, but you can also just Google for it. Uh, they're not named after me, but after Tony by Nerd, just saying. <laughs> but yeah, they basically give you a reference of new C++ features, and their corresponding old style C++ code. So you're gonna get an idea of where the improvements are and how modern features actually map to the language. Right, uh, to give you a problem statement here, I'd like to uh, start off with some C17 code. Uh, more precisely, this is actually C14, but let's go with it. And this is a, um, so this might just be a simple function that returns a bit mask for whatever application. And there are two features here. First of all, this is a binary, binary literal, which I believe is a C14 thing. It's just expressing this thing as a binary number. Um, and the th second thing is this digit separator that neatly allows us to separate this digit into two separate groups. Makes it easier to realize that this one is at the eighth position. If this apostrophe were missing, it's kind of, okay, how many zeros is there? Or is it six, seven? So yeah, what the compiler will be doing with that code is relatively simple, it just returns a number. So it will turn that into some assembly code where it loads the number 128 into a register and then returns for the function. So, at least that's what's happening, what happens with GCC 4.9. If you use GCC 4.8, you will get a very sad or angry um, programmer because it won't compile. It won't compile because well, GCC 4.8 supports the binary literals, but it does not support the digit separators. Um, that's kind of annoying because, you know, the feature isn't critical, we can still work without it, but it does add benefits to the language. It adds benefits in terms of readability and in terms of safety in a sense, because it prevents us, or at least makes it less likely, that we miscount the number of zeros here, for instance. So if, if there were a way, we would really prefer to, um, to go with it. So yeah. There are multiple solutions to this problem. What can we do? Well, we just upgrade our compiler. Upgrade our compiler to a newer version that supports all of these features, and we're good. Unless that's not actually possible. It, it's just not always feasible to do, especially in bigger projects where transitions to newer compiler versions might significantly impact, well, they might incur significant overhead in terms of work. Um, because you need to make sure that the code base actually compiles to the same behavior. New compiler versions might introduce bugs and you just want to make sure that all of the transition is safe. Similarly, in embedded systems, you're kind of bound to what your um, development board vendor is actually providing you with. Some people just are very slow with updating to new compiler versions and sometimes your compiler vendor might just not care about updating the platform at all anymore. 
and then you're just stuck with that system. So if that's the case for you, I just stick with the older version of C++. You know, what's so bad about it? Well, it will give you a higher cost of maintenance because you don't get to enjoy all of the benefits we've seen in the previous slide. It will also have a higher risk of bugs in production and, uh, in the sense that the lack of type safety, or rather the lack of the improvements to type safety, will make it harder for you to construct your programs in a way that runtime errors are actually detected at compile time already. And you will only know, notice some of the bugs in production, and then can, depending on the application, cost you actual money. But yeah, I've introduced a third, uh, third, third solution to this problem. It's called Clang from the Future, and this is my lift Clang based tool. What is it actually? Well, the Clang based, duh. Um, it's a preprocessor for another tool chain. So you can still keep using your current compiler, doesn't make a difference, but CFDF is a program that is um, basically put in front of that and just preprocesses the source code for you, similar to the C pro processor. And what it does, it, it performs an automatic conversion from the C17 input to an equivalent C11 program. So how does that actually look like? The usual build pipeline is just the source code, goes into C++ compiler, goes to the linker, and goes to the executable. So this might be more complicated, like you have multiple source files and you give all to the C++ compiler, but this is conceptually the flow that we have. Now with C++, uh, with CFTF, what we do is we kind of sneak in two additional steps in here, like this. So we use libclang to build an AST, an abstract syntax tree representation of our program, um, on which we then detect various patterns, such as are there any fold expressions in use? Fold expressions in use? Are there any uh, uh, structured bindings? Are there constant expert? Things like that. And based on the things we find, we modify the input source file and produce an equivalent C++11 source file that is then fed into the actual C++ compiler that we want to use, then again into the linker, and then produce an executable. So we can see that we have this kind of split in two processes here. The right side is just the front end compiler, as I call it here. And this is the part that is actually handled by CFTF. Right, and the idea is basically, uh, uh, in the idea workflow, you can just ignore CFTF. It's just an additional um, build step that is just transparently put in, in place and you never need to inspect its output, but rather just feed it into the next compiler and it just happens underneath uh, the surface. By the way, if anybody has any questions throughout the entire talk, feel free to ask. I don't mind interruptions. Cool. So looking back at the problem statement that we had, uh, we can now take our C17 program, run CFTF over it, and we get a source files such as this, where the binary literal and the digit separator are just replaced by uh, the actual number that we represent. And this program can easily be translated by GCC 4.8 then. So we get the same executable out that we would have with the modern compiler, and as a bonus, we get a happy program out of it. So it's always great. Yeah, uh, so what components does CFTF actually include? Well, first of all, the command line interface. And the idea is that the next slides will just be a summary of a more demo-y kind of presentation. So uh, bear with me for a second until I find the demo source code. Mm. There we go. Can everybody read this big enough? That's good. Awesome. Um, so this is a very simple application using the if init syntax from C++17, where, um, so the idea is I just want to write a function that, uh, that adds an element to this map of ints to string. Um, and the function should log whether it actually added a new element or whether the element was already included in the map. So the way I do this is I use this function mplace just inserts a new element into the map and returns an iterator to the inserted element and a Boolean indicating whether the insertion actually took place. And this is rather awkward uh, with traditional if syntaxes because we would need to declare the thing outside the if statement and then check for the condition at the end, um, which is the dot second thing which extracts the Boolean. So there is no way to just say auto IT and status and have it automatically check that, but you need to separate the check explicitly. 
But yeah, with the if init syntax, we can just do the variable declaration at the beginning and then have a separate condition right there. Now, um, the way I do this with CFTF now is I just call this program, CFTF, point it to the input source, which is, what should that come on the video? <laughs> um, point it at the input source, and then I specify the front end compiler, which I do just by writing this. And in this case, I can just point it to G++. I can also point it to an absolute path. These have been G++. It doesn't make a difference in this case. And yeah, you can see it prints some stuff out. Yeah, should probably, yeah, thank you. So it prints out some stuff, and in the end you see it invokes the actual command line. Um, and it produces this a.out executable, which just says add it and already exists because I called the function twice with the same argument. But yeah, let's look at what the uh, tool actually produced as an output, which is this file. And it looks rather ugly, as you can see. So the rewriting isn't meant to be human readable, so this would look rather confusing. But we can just run a uh, Clang format on it. And then it's somewhat more readable. <laughs> so you can see that what the tool output is basically a regular if, exp if condition, if statement, where you have just a conditional in the uh, uh, parenthesis, and the declaration is um, drawn outside of the statement so that it actually compiles this plain C11. And the tool also inserts these additional curly braces outside of it so that the declaration doesn't leak outside of the if statement, which is kind of a big deal for some people. So that's quite useful too. But yeah, you can see this is just regular C11 and could be compiled by any such compiler. Um, another example might be cons if. There's something I wanted to show. Yeah. Oh well. Okay, this is getting somewhat out of order, but yeah, um, cons if is a feature that allows you to um, basically statically decide which of the two branch bodies to compile. And this is kind of difficult because depending on a template parameter of a function, um, some of the parts might not actually compile. Say uh, we are um, const expr-ifing on whether the type is a string or an integer, for instance. We might exploit the string properties in one branch and the integer properties in another. another. And if we just omitted the const expr keyword, the code wouldn't compile because it's just not valid. valid. But yeah, what uh, CFTF does with this source code is outputting lots of stuff. But yeah. So you can see this is getting rather complicated at some point. Um, but basically what CFTF does, it automatically generates two specializations for this function. One for the first argument, which was a, yeah, an int. And we see the specialization right here. And you can see the if else const extra thing was just, um, compressed down to a single if statement. So the stuff that was in the else branch is completely gone because it wasn't taken in that case. Um, similarly, the specialization for doubles contains the other branch. So this is the double threshold thing and this is the direct comparison for this code. And it just picks whatever um, applies for the given const expert branch. Right. Um, do we have another example? Yeah, uh, third example is structured bindings. So structured bindings allows you to destructure, for instance, tuples into two different variables, which can be quite handy sometimes. So if you have a tuple, um, hello world, and 25, you can actually store the return type of this, the return value of this function in two separate variables. But again, this is C++ 17 only. But what CFTF can do Uh, 
uh, is to expand the entire um, destructuring operation to a separate um, declaration, which just captures the tuple and then destructures it manually using split get. So this one first declares the string by getting the first tuple element, and this one gets the number by getting the second tuple element. And that just has the same effect. A question right there? Yeah, so if you're using structured bindings, though, aren't those supposed to be references? Like, so you're copying, you're making a copy of that int, and so you have a completely different life cycle or uh, lifetime of the, that value for that number. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, that's actually a weakness of the tool right now. Uh, it's actually more complicated than what you were saying, though. Um, you're saying it's supposed to be a reference, but actually it's a different kind of reference than what we're used to. Because if you were in the original code snippet, um, oh, thanks. If you were to take the decal type of the um, variable number, for instance, then you might expect this decal type to be a reference of int but it's actually, by the standard, uh, supposed to be just a plain int. So it's... Come again? Yeah, so it's a different kind of, it's a kind of transparent reference, so to speak. So it behaves like a reference, but it just isn't. It just directly refers to the actual tuple element. So in other words, it basically um, behaves as if you, at any place where you access number, were instead accessing number through the actual tuple. That's reasonably accurate, maybe. You're saying that transformation preserves the, the intended behavior? It preserves the type, but it doesn't preserve the fact that, you know, there shouldn't be any copies. So there's still some there's stuff left to do here. Right, um, what's also supported is I'm doing the same on destructuring when you want to do structured bindings on uh, structs. Uh, for time constraints, I won't show you the generated code, but that is supported as well. And similarly, it also supports destructuring structs or types where you manually define std get. Um, actually, let's look at the generated code for that one, that one because it's rather interesting. So in this case, it's kind of a symbiosis of the const expert if uh, implementation where get is simplified a little bit. Um, and yeah, down here we can see um, that again, we get the separate declaration for the actual uh, struct type and the separate declaration of the individual members. Right. And the last example that I meant to show off is uh, well, I actually meant to show off fault expressions, but I didn't quite get around implementing those in time. But instead, my tool actually supports backporting C++11 pack expansions to C++03, which hopefully is equally impressive. So let's go with that. So we can see we have a variable template here um, doing some sort of summation. Again, using if, if const expert. And you can see the output of the tool is rather extensive on that one. And yeah, so what it will be doing in this case, it will generate explicit gener specialization for each of the possible um, parameters. So we, since it's a recursive template, we get one for two template, for two parameters, one for three parameters, for th four parameters, etc. In each case, it will replace size of dot 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 parameter pack with the actual size of the template and it will replace the sum with the actual list of parameters. So I find that is quite neat um, that this stuff actually works. And yeah, it's a pity that I couldn't make this work for full expressions quite yet, but um, hopefully that shouldn't be too much work from now. Cool, so well, that said, basically the components that I illustrated here are, well, first of all, ASTA visitors, which is the part in the Clang that actually shows us, well, allows us to detect the patterns of C17 and 14 structures. The command line interface, which transparently allows us to invoke a front-end compiler. Um, a rewrite engine, which 
Actually, libclimb provides already one. It's called AST Rewriter, and it just does what you know you see there. It allows you to replace individual parts of the input source with other replacement parts, so to speak. But I actually had to rewrite that thing because um, it kind of gets ugly when you do need to do things like fold expressions, for instance, which might contain other statements or expressions that need to be rewritten, such as a fold expression. So you can nest these things, and then Clang's rewriter just breaks down, basically. So I had to do some sort of tree-based um, rewriting engine of my own. Fourth major point, and that's actually the biggest component with about 50% of all lines of code currently, is a template specialization engine, where um, for some, um, some replacements, you actually need to know the type of the current function, or rather the template parameter types of, for the current function. And there's not really any good way to do that, other than explicitly specializing all the things. And well, there's a test suite, which um, just makes sure that I, so to speak, catch all of the more possible corner cases that might be um, hidden or hit in the tool. So yeah, examples, we've seen all of these, I believe. Oh yeah, there's also return type deduction, which we kind of glossed over. Um, you can write functions like auto function and then return a value, and the auto keyword will just deduce um, the return type of that value. So that's a new C++ 14 feature, and CFTF also supports that kind of stuff. And if you've paid, atten paid close attention, um, there's actually some trickery going on uh, when functions might return different kind of return types. So yeah, that's fun. Uh, in practice, um, you can just use the tool like this, and there's actually easy integration into your existing build pipeline. So probably you're not compiling like this manually, but you might be using make files. Well, just replace your CXS, CXX with CFTF as a compiler, and then add uh, the front-end compiler option to your CXX flags. And calling make for sanely behaved um, make file setups will just transfer transparently do this for you. If you're using CMake, it's even easier. Well, well just about the same, but it worked work consistently for every CMake project, I believe, where you just call uh, minus D CMake CXX flags to do this thing automatically. And to illustrate that, let's go to the actual test suite of the, um, of the tool. And I know I'm running short of time, but this is kind of nice to see, so let's just look at it. Yeah. So there's the CMake, uh, CMake list file in the directory, and I just copy paste this line right here. And of course, I need to point it to the directory. You're missing a code. Yeah. And you can see it just runs CMake through manually. It detects our compiler, so to speak. But it's just going to generate the build files, and you can then call make, and it just runs the tool automatically. And normally it isn't quite that slow. Maybe I messed up something in the recent changes. But yeah, you know, you can see it works. So, um, and at the end of the day, it will produce the test binaries. Although in this case, this is rather um, the executed builds generated here aren't particularly interesting because it's mostly just static asserts. We've got a question back there. Pardon? The CCC involved with the... Right, yeah. Yeah, the tool currently doesn't make any effort to actually strip off that argument. But uh, the tool will actually compile as C17 even if you don't specify it minus std equals C17. So in theory, it should still work with a compiler that, front end compiler that doesn't support that. Right, other setups may need some creativity. You can employ similar strategies. Um, you can also just replace the compiler executable, for instance. That's kind of hacky, but it should also work in theory. Right, use cases. Um, there are a couple of them that I believe are valid. Um, early adoption and evaluation of the new standard in your project might be um, interesting if you currently cannot actually have, if you currently have not access to an up-to-date compiler and still want to see what you can do with the new language. Uh, use of C++17 libraries such as Range V3 or HANA um, might at some point be possible in C++11 setups. 
supports the legacy platforms when you already have an existing C14 or 17 um, project but want to backport it to a platform that does not support that, um, which should be especially easy due to the transparent integration into your build pipeline. And finally, seeing what the compiler sees, although for that specific purpose, I do recommend C Insight instead, Insights instead, which is a project that is actually targeted to that particular use case. So, yeah, uh, current status I published this thing on last Friday on GitHub. You can take a look at it if you like. Uh, link is on the next slide. Uh, it's a usual drop in plugin uh, for drop in. Um, Process, so to speak, for GCC and Clang on Linux. Uh, patches for Windows and Mac OS welcome at this point. Um, there's a small set of initially supported features. You've basically seen most of them already, but uh, the idea is to focus on getting it correct first and then slowly extending the feature set so that we can make sure that the output programs actually don't break anything. And yeah, uh, try it out if you like. Um, Please not in production, but uh, I believe it's stable enough to, you know, be experimented and tinkered with. And please do report issues if you find any. Future uh, more rewriting rules. Um, I'm kind of curious what do people want most. Feel free to raise issues or um, poke me on Slack about this kind of stuff. Um, C plus plus two A support would be quite nice. Concepts and contracts can, in theory, um, be supported. And then. Maybe we can go back further than C11 and support C03, for instance. Better test coverage, full C professor support, and a better debugging experience if you think of uh, source information during debugging, for instance. So that's all kind of a pipe dream, but we'll see how it goes. But yeah, tell me about what you want to see. Summary, uh, you can read that at home. <laughs> With that said, here's the link to the tool. Uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to come to me on stage or somewhere during the conference later. That's that. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention.